perfect do it Woohoo! done good so going back to this uh the garrity article will be the actual research article i will be talking about the england article is more used in order to support my arguments and also make their point that healthcare systems have an entire different view in really going about that all right opening the stage i wrote a blog to you and send you the link and i hope you had some time to look into this because i know that nobody has time to read an article we noticed from journal clubs but i really hope that kind of made it easier for you and gave you some idea about what this whole thing is about if not go back to this link afterwards and it's it's a nice collaboration that i saw from all kinds of different places all right, in order to really come up with a definition, I actually had to go back into an article of higher education. When we talk about co-production, co-creation, there's all kinds of different verbiages out there. I had to look into higher ed. And in higher education, co-creation or co-production is really a collaboration of learning and teaching with professors, so staff, well, in this case, it's, it's British, so faculty and students working collaboratively with one another to create components of curricula or other pedagogical um, approaches. Now, Paul Bertalsen, who is actually a co-author of the Academic Medicine article, he cast it a little wider and he puts the benefit in here. He says, co-creation in healthcare is interdependent work of users and professionals that is intentionally designed to contribute to the health of individuals and populations. And in the end, this is why we're all here. We all want to collaborate and we want to be able to pull prof, um, students into this to really increase and contribute to health and individuals and populations and alleviate the pain and suffering that's out there. All right, well, talking with students, here's where all these different definitions come in. Students might have different roles. They are called co-researchers. They are called pedagogical co-designers, consultants, representatives. As you can see here, students have different roles. It is in this entire world of co-production. And when we talk about co-production, all these different tech terms are also included into this, this into these definitions here. However, looking into co-production of healthcare services, this is where we really say this should really be healthcare, health, a patient-centered care, and it's very core. So, according to the Institute of Medicine, patient-centered care is one of the six fundamental aims of the U.S. healthcare system. Hence, co-production of healthcare services includes all the stakeholders in such a system. And this should be the ideal world. That means we have shared decision making with the patient, patient engagement, patient activation, rel relationship centered care, of course, very important during COVID. And the ideal world, this is a really fantastic big system. However, it's very, very hard to attain. And for the ones of you who looked into this article, you will see that there is these schematics out there. We will see it's actually not that simple. Healthcare system has a lot of stakeholders and a lot of um, components and is anchored in communities and societies and they all have a role they all have opinions right there's po politics as we know so again the academic medicine paper um, approaches this entire concept that something that maybe or could be not as a given fact as we have already in the Garrity article that actually will give us an example how students are included and you probably came across um, this headline this morning, COVID vaccination, the epitome of patient-centered care. And we right now, we all experience that it is more than, than hard to really make it work and we get aware of all the different layers, how this logistic is supposed to work. Now, interestingly enough, let's move out of this a little bit. And we all know that healthcare is in a way an industry, right? What have Apple, Google, Ikea, Lego, Heineken, BMW, Coca-Cola in common? Well, guess what? They reach out to us as users and collaborate together with us on their product. What you see here is a beautiful BMW. BMW has actually an idea lab where you can make your ideas known. Alice had her app produced by Apple and they got back to her and explained to her how it was done and we did it together and, and it was a great product. Lego, if any of you wants to have your Lego dream marketed, well, reach out to Lego, they might market it for you. But lo and behold, the industry has solved this. However, there's an important point. The industry also came up with a lot of platforms, collaborations, boot camps. They reach out to schools, how to really include stakeholders and really include their customers for making a, a superior product that goes just beyond their own uh, R&D teams. So let's pause here a little bit. What is co-production for you? So as someone involved in medical education, what do you think about co-production? And what does it mean to you as a clinician? Anita, I open the floor to you. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. So I think, um, you know, we already had an overview of what co-production is. But when I was thinking specifically about co-production and what it meant to me, I think it's really at its core, the ability to really be um, a driver of your education. And so for, for me being in the perspective of a residency program, it's really the ability to give feedback and then see how that feedback is actually implemented. Um, and I think it's really having full transparency um, with the process of how curriculum is developed and, and how we decide what is gonna be taught to, to our learners. And so I think that's really what it means in the med ed world is taking feedback from our learners and and seeing how we can incorporate that into their education. And then as, as a clinician and clinically, I think it means you know coming up with a plan of care together with our patients. I think all of us have this experience where if we ask our patients and involve them in a decision-making process, they're much more likely to you know, uh, carry on with our treatment plan, whether it's you know, diabetes management or weight loss or whatever it may be. If we, if we put them in the position of having power and taking ownership over their, their health and their education, they're more likely to, to follow that through. So I, I think that's really what it means to me. I'm curious to see what other people think, if they agree or if there's a slightly different definition for them. Does anybody in the audience have any other thoughts on that as a clinician, what it means to you? I know um, Ellie already said it's a great idea. Does anybody have an example of co-production that they've done? Well, out of time, since we started a little late, Elizabeth, do you want to continue? Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much. And that was very good feedback, actually. We will get into this just in a moment. So. Structures need to be in place in, in order to really make co-production work. And feedback is a big point, Anita. You really hit, hit the nail right on the head. There has to be urgency. There has to be vision. There has to be a goal. There has to be a partnership, one or the other way. There also has to be a platform, a methodology, a structure, an organizational piece. Otherwise, it cannot occur in air. It really needs something to hold on. And this is very important. Also, we want to go to the point where it prompts self-assessment and reflection in order to move a vision forward, right? And in the end, it all will need a growth mindset because a lot of people, a lot of stakeholders used to lead have to take themselves back in order to let other voices go in and in order to let other voices be heard. Okay, this is the actual article. Empowering medical students as agents of curricular change, a value-added approach to student engagement in medical education. Let's see how it is. So the University of Illinois, Chicago of Medicine, Established in 2012, the Student Curricula Board uh, SCB to support curricula co-production. So they put a pretty well organized structure in place to really have students and faculty exchange ideas, exchange feedback. Um, it, it is actually the student that recruit other students into this process. The students receive training in how to talk to administration, in conflict management, in giving feedback. And then they are distributed to different phases. So this structure, and it will show you a, a visual just in a moment. This structure has four different phases. There can be pre-clerkship, clerkship, post-clerkship, post then there's special products and overall curriculum improvement. And students are firmly, um, firmly included into this process and have a very vivid discussion both ways. So this is the way this looks. There's the student body, you have the SCB members, and they talk on an ongoing basis with administrative committees and with educators. And feedback is a very important point here. And you will see what, what is being said about feedback a little bit later. So Garrity and his colleagues asked the question, well, this is great, but what is, it, what is its effectiveness? And is it transferable to other organizations? So here's the sample and here's the methods. They started, well, actually they started the whole thing in 2012 but they measured it in 2017. All students together are 753 students, so quite a bit. The student curricula board is all, only a smaller fraction, so this is only 80 students, and again, they're selected by students in four different phases. And the study design is fairly straightforward. It's a mixed methods um, study design. They ask about perception, about the impact of the SCB and transferability to other institution, let's say to us, right? It is a like a type survey with a lot of open ended question and the authors were kind enough to send them to me so I can really answer your question here. 
um, they applied key square tests and Kronbach's also to really look into uh, reliability and validity into, this, into the findings. And there were open-ended questions which were themed by two authors through the lens of quantitative findings. So very straightforward. Just want to pause for a second. Do we believe this is sound and appropriate for these methods, for this setup? I'm happy to start. Um, so I think uh, I agree, you know, surveying the residents and the, or sorry, the medical students, the trainees um, is definitely the best way to see how they feel and their perception of, of this uh, SCB. Um, the only thing I would add is if you really want to see if this is um, an effective um, system, you want to know what students thought beforehand. So the only other thing I would suggest is maybe taking a look and surveying students who passed through this medical school prior to the um, inception of this new system um, to kind of get a pre and post test value. Um, and then the only other thing is maybe also asking the faculty and the administration what they think, if, if they feel like um, this is, this, they feel like there's more engagement on their end, do they feel like um, they're getting good feedback from the students and they're able to incorporate it and they're able to grow as educators as well. I think that would have also been an interesting piece to see, is it really just students who are benefiting from this intervention or is the institution as a whole benefiting? I'm wondering if anyone else had some thoughts like that or if, if you think those, those other groups would have been um, you know, important to survey. I love your point about faculty, Anita, because it is co-production, it's not uni production. So just when faculty do it alone, you don't want students to do it alone, so it's co. So I love that point, I appreciate that. Okay, Elizabeth, okay. maybe out of time. Absolutely, we'll... and by the way, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> this is very, this is this is a really good point. And yeah, it's not co-production, it's, it's unilateral, right? So it's, yeah. All right, so let's see what the survey results actually were. And I think they were quite interesting. So they had a really high response rate, which is good. Um, 63 students um, were SCB. So they also had a high response rate from the students who were from the student curriculum board. Um, very high agreement about the importance of curriculum involvement. However, they were kind of shy, more than 50% of students viewed the opportunities for student engagement favorably. and they never followed up that outcome. I have no idea why and what, what about that. So I think this is actually a really interesting finding. Um, they agreed that uh, the administration valued input. So again, from their side, the students said, yeah, administration valued it. 80% um, agreed on SCP advocacy and fostering collaboration. They, agree, they agreed on improvements by that. But they also said uh, senior students actually expressed a higher awareness of curricular initiatives, which is not very surprising because as students grow into the system, right, they, they, they develop the skills, they develop more and more the perception and the awareness of what's going on. So in other words, the longer students are involved, the more they would probably get out of it. So they'd oh, make the, the 77, the 80 and the 71 agreed. Was that a faculty number or a student number? I'm just it's wondering. What it's was that? all students. It, this is all an students. entire student. It was all students. So Anita made a very good point that no faculty was, was surveyed in this. In this so, and it was it was not with those numbers, 77, 80 and 71. That was not just the SCB. Am I correct? You are correct. These are all students across the board. Right. OK, I'm just making sure. Absolutely. Thank you very much for pointing that out. It's still a high number. It's, it's still, it's the, the, the response rate was really very high and it's still very high, yeah. So, but let's look into the themes. And I think this is very interesting. Um, themes that represent strengths and themes that represent weaknesses, we get to them a little later. Um, I put them here on the slide. It are the six, the six themes that represent strengths. Students say they felt empowerment and ownership. So they kind of really felt they were invested in their own education. They felt there is a voice, there's advocacy. So they really appreciated that their voice is being heard and valued. They also appreciate the student faculty collaboration. So they, when they say complexity of medical education, again, once you get involved, you'll notice how many layers are there. So they valued and appreciate the complexity of medical education. 
They also gained exposure to mentors. So they individually, I would say, got something out of this. They also appreciated the organized student feedback. And Anita, this is going back to feedback, so important in medical education. Um, this student board allowed for a synthesis of ideas and greater advocacy for change. Then also there was reactivity to specific issues. So the student appreciated peer responses to certain incidents. So in other words, by organizing such a structure within the student body, there was suddenly a nucleus of peer-to-peer -peer communication that could deal with certain issues. And that was certainly a benefit for them that they perceived this as a benefit as well. And then last but not least, and I think this is interesting, uh, they claimed there was exposure to academic medicine, saying so involved students reported more interest and better preparation for careers in academic medicine. And I'm not quite sure if this means that this would be faculty coming back and teach at that medical school or if they go somewhere else. But lo and behold, for career as medical educators, as uh, physician educators, they expressed an interest how to do this. So far as so good, these are the positive themes, the strengths that the students perceived. Um, I have here some quotes and I put it into entire um, perspective so you, you can see some idea that they had. And um, based on, on how they dealt with the methods, they probably used these representative quotes of really getting their codes together. And these quotes, they nicely shore up their ideas. So overall, the students are really appreciative and to say they get a lot of out of it. And also future looking, this is something that the students certainly helps. So I leave this then for such a second. And interesting, again, is here exposure to academic medicine. So now they have an opportunity for the first time to really take an active role and to think, wow, this could probably be a way how to act later on in my career. So I think in a way it was identity forming as well. So let's go here to the weaknesses. Visibility. The students want regular update regarding curricular changes going back to feedback. I think this will be a subject that's important. There's opportunities for involvement. So interesting, there's still students that say they are not seen and they want to get the opportunity for involvement. And since this is students who um, recruit students, probably the students amongst themselves have to make sure that there is leadership that looks more into this. So I see here something in the, all right. I was just looking into the chat function, no problem. So then they also, they want a faster turnaround. So if there's feedback discussed, make it faster. And my feeling is that this, this feedback will just never go away. This will just always be stand there. I mean, feedback always can be faster. And they also say, well, there is a focus on senior students. So they still perceive that most students let effort go on what happens on a pre uh, clerkship curriculum. This is a little bit missed out. So there is a focus on senior students, but there is a disbalance about what is currently being looked on and if this could be evenly distributed. But it's probably the senior students, the more they have input in earlier years. So it is probably something that has to be leveraged by the faculty themselves. And I believe I have, okay. And here are representative quotes from here. So they, it shows there is a little bit of a disconnect, but here is actually where such a perception survey can really help and tell the students themselves, well, this is what we found. Now, how can we do it? How can, how can we do it better? And I really would hope there is hopefully a follow-up survey or a follow-up publication that says, okay, so this is what we implemented and this is how we fixed these issues or how we attack these issues. Now, does these results surprise you? And more than that, is the research question answered, which means the impact and the transferability to a different institution. And I make a pause here for a second. Anita, I want to open the floor to you. So I think like you mentioned, I, I'm not really surprised by the results either. You know, it seems like if we have a system in place that's allowing for student feedback in their education, I am, I, I am, you know, I, I'm aware that the results were generally positive. And I think the interesting dichotomy between the, the strengths and the weaknesses is I'd love to see a breakdown of actually the respondents who answered those strengths and weakness questions in the sense of were they SCB members or not. 
Um, because it seems like a lot of the positive and the strengths were, you know, you, um, exposure to academic medicine, being able to face to face with higher level administrators. Whereas, you know, that seems like that's probably specific to the people who are involved in the SCB, but, you know, the average student who's not involved in the SCB probably isn't going to have the opportunity to do those things. And you kind of see that coming up in the, in the weaknesses where they said, you know, for the 180 members of the student body who are not part of the SCB, how, how do you really get to be involved and have your voice heard? But I do think that that's part of any organization. And, you know, in any organization, you have leaders, and then you have people who are not leaders, but are part of that organization. And you're always going to have that dichotomy between the two. But I just thought it was an interesting point. Um, and then in terms of whether the research question is uh, answered, you know, I think we can very clearly see based on the results um, of this study that the student body in general finds this to be a very effective program. They are happy with, you know, their interface, they're happy that their voice is heard and that they're able to, to see change in their, in their institution. Um, the transferability question, though, I feel like isn't exactly answered. You know, there's, there's no clear way to determine whether this is going to be applicable, you know, at our program or at a different program. And, um, you know, I, I think that is something that is just really going to have to come from within. That has to come from within the institution, having, you know, leaders who are willing to take on that change. So I don't know if based on, you know, what we've gone through, anyone else has some comments to say about whether they do think that transferability question was really answered. Thank you, Anita. And just to make one point of your um, of the themes being from the student body versus students from the curricula board. So they actually checked in their in their quantitative Likert scales about validity, reliability, right? So they they corrected for that or they looked for internal differences for that. They did not do this with the themes. I mean, I understand, you know, because then they would have, you know, two columns, right? It would it would be very um, very complex and it's a lot of work, but I think it's a very good point. You know, they lumped them together. Like, I think they shouldn't have to, they shouldn't have probably, but I, I still think it is great information. And yeah, we'll see about the transferability, hopefully in a follow-up email. All right. I think having faculty view would also help as Anita said yeah. also, because you can't talk about transferability without faculty view. Okay. I, I agree with you, Anita, about the about the transferability question. I think a lot of this, the, the results, they really focus on a subjective response to this, this way of learning and this academic approach. Um, if there were like a few more objective ways of analyzing, you know, how this approach affects, whether it's in grades at, you know, at the end of the semester, or if it's, um, you know, in how in, in, you know, the choices that, you know, students make in uh, the next stage of their career and things like that. If there's a few more objective endpoints that we can see that might speak more to the transferability of it versus just the subjective feeling that yes it's a good you know it's a good system for taking on feedback and adjusting the curriculum based on my feedback that seems like something that could be different from place to place but a little bit more objective results might help us to see what that looks like as well thank you very much all right Let's move on. So this is this uh these were the discussion points that comes out for suggested implementations. Talking about this, so they say involve motivated student leaders. So really, crystallize out leaders who collaborate with peers and faculty alike. So in other words, they they see the need for brokers that can work with both party and can can liaise and make the communication really seamless that they're willing to investigate curricular issues with a solution-based approach. So that seems to be like some smoothing out certain communication issues. It makes total sense and that's fine. Then point number two, and this is something that I put in yellow because this is kind of a sore point that always comes out for me when they say, well, co collaboration with students, give the students the formal training and give them the tools. I think it is so important to also train the students, how is the curriculum designed? What are the formal things? What, what is really, what are the tasks? What are the components out there that have to be understood in order to put anything together? So this is a kind of design training. This is a kind of leadership training that students need. And they say here, well, provide students with formal training. This is really very, very important. They also say uh, systematically integrate curricular student groups into the structure of the medical school. So really make it a part of this. They also say support an institution-wide cultural shift that empowers students. 
which seems like there is still some edges and probably that's why we really need to hear back from, from faculty here, that it doesn't seem to be completely accepted, but that's fine. There's probably a, a gray range out there and disseminate information regarding improvements to students and faculty in real time. So overall, and I think I have another pause, I'm not sure if you need this, but because you got into this, but I think they also picked here on very, very granular ideas. The communication is really key, key that the culture is really has to embrace these ideas. Otherwise it's not going to work. The students need the tech, the tools basically to do this. And it has to be an integral part of the institution. And when we here talk about transferability, these ha probably has to be embodied by every institution in a different way because institutions are individual and embracing works everywhere from a different angle. All right, what are your opinions on that? I was giving people a second, I, I can jump in. I mean, I already kind of commented on this, but I think, um, you know, folk, the, the previous slide really kind of pinpointed the like necessities. The, those are the kind of the necessities in order to be able to adopt something like this. But I agree that I think you really need to individualize this program for the institution because you have to take into account the institution's priorities. Um, you have to take into account the administration's view. And, you know, everyone agrees that we, we want to have better, you know, communication with our student body and administration, but they need to be willing to adopt this model and, and, and the way to do it may differ based on the institution. So having that buy-in from your stakeholders um, is really key. And I think, um, you know, speaking to the faculty and, and is really important. And that's why I feel like the faculty piece would have been so interesting here to see, you know, even their perception, were they willing to, to take on this SDB model initially? Were they hesitant about it? And what are their feelings now? So I think those are kind of key points in order to really uh, take a look at whether this could be implemented somewhere else. I want to say that it's interesting. You're really talking about culture change and we have students on our curriculum committee, but the interesting thing is the students on our curriculum committee for the medical school, and I can't speak about how residency does this with curriculum as easily, is they respond after the fact. So they, they respond to a report to confirm a report is accurate or not. The next step of making edits for the next time around I don't know that the students are involved. So they're only there in a, we push information out for them, they respond, and then the communication stops. It would be great to have a system where the communication would continue and the students would be involved in the suggested changes, if that's making sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense because you make one change and you really, respond to the concerns of one cohort that's not there anymore. And you hope for the best that you hit, hit it right. And very often, as we see in undergraduate faculty development, you don't, the next cohort is not welcoming new changes. And <laughs> so continuity is, is really hard to do. Okay, thank you. So the study limitations that I found so again, I want to get back to this 50% of students, and this was across, who said, who viewed the opportunities for student engagement favorably. I think that's a pretty low kind of number, shy of more than 50%. So I want to know what that means, but that was about it. Again, there was no indication of educational training. So I would love to have seen that, but all right, you know, it's not there, but they give them communication training. They give them um, conf conflict negotiation. I think these are very important trainings to have. Uh, there is no question in the survey about perception of workplace ap applicability. So in other words, can it be transferred over to their career afterwards? And when the students say they want to be part of academic medicine, does this mean retention and recruitment? So for instance, at our medical school students, they say they want to return as faculty. They really would love to teach. Does this happen here? Is this what they mean with academic medicine? Well, I hope it does. I hope it does. So we don't really see it, but again, I hope it does. I mean, overall, I feel it's a big organizational structure that's in place. It's really impressive numbers of students and it has been going on since 2012. So there's a nice collaboration and a nice continuity going on. 
And I'm really watching out, hopefully, for another survey piece or even how they might um, deal with these concerns that came up here. And I'm saying thank you very much on this part. And you want to have Wendy continue, please? Sure thing. So, um, Elizabeth, if you can proceed to the next slide, please. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so the bibliometric data that you're going to see, um, actually, I had realized that this one is um, not for the one that we just discussed, but the first one, but I'll also give you the data for the other one, and I'll add those into the final slide that gets sent out to everyone. Um, so for the first article, the kind of the, the primer or primer article that um, Elizabeth had provided or Dr. Schlegel had provided, um, this is the altmetric data for that. And altmetric, for those of you who are um, new to kind of bibliometric data, is um, all of the alternative metrics that are captured on a particular citation. So that includes like the media, um, news feeds, uh, other social media platforms, as well as um, Mendeley, which is also kind of a hybrid between a citation management system and a social media site. So um, for the first article, um, there were seven um, tweets. Um, and what I actually, seven tweeters, so seven users who generated nine tweets about the article. And what I like to highlight, especially, is that those seven users have an upper bound um, of close to almost 35,000 followers, which means a lot more exposure um, to whatever article that it, you are speaking about. Um, Altmetric also provides information on um, on where the readers are coming from. So most of it's from North America as well as a breakdown of the demographic. So were they general members of the, the public? Were they scientists, et cetera? So that kind of breaks down here, um, the majority being members of the public. Um, what I actually like to highlight in addition to that are the next slide, um, which we won't move on to quite yet, but the next slide provides you with site backs to this particular article, um, which I'll show you kind of the listing of um, related articles or articles that cited back to the article so that you can um, view it at your own leisure if you're interested. Um, but what I like to highlight is the Mendeley readers for each of the articles. So Mendeley, like I said, is a hybrid between a social media platform and a citation, bibliographic citation management system. And um, there's been a study on how the Mendeley readers, the number of Mendeley readers um, are a better predictor of an article getting cited um, in another paper, um, more so than let's say um, Twitter. Um, so on this, in this particular case, there's 14 Mendeley readers that have physically saved this article into their library, um, whether it be for just kind of consumption later on, or maybe perhaps a site back you, um, for their manuscript. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this information um, is uh, actually pulled from Dimensions, which is a new product that I actually haven't used in previous presentations. So Dimensions is um, very similar to um, other products out there that really track scholarly production and how things are being um, cited back and tracked. Uh, so Dimensions provides that kind of um, functionality in, 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 to be able to track scholarly production. Um, within the Dimensions database, there were five articles that cited this particular article. And for those of you who are interested, the links are available on the PowerPoint link, um, PowerPoint slide, excuse me. So what I actually want to go into after this is the England article, Englander article, which we just discussed, the main article. So for that one, there were actually more tweeters. There were 21 tweeters with um, an upper bound um, number of followers to 26,000, almost 27,000. Um, there was one Facebook page mention, um, four dimension sites, um, site backs um, captured on dimensions, one of them being this Amy guide number 138. This was also one of the articles that cited um, the Englander article. And there was actually one, um, there were 20 Mendeley readers, so it's more than the first article as well. But I wanted to go on to one article that cited the Englander article is about um, innovations during times of COVID. Um, so I thought it was actually really applicable in the fact that, you know, the, the integrated, um, the importance of co-production with students to um, better create, you know, new learning materials, resources, ways of teaching um, in 
in this current time in which we really had to kind of be flexible and innovative with the way that we teach. So I thought that was um, a really useful or a really important kind of aspect to um, put in there and in the fact that, you know, co-production is valuable, especially in times of change like this. Thank you. I want to say that um, Eric Kumbold on one of your articles is one of the leading um, GME people. He's head of ACGME, and which is the accrediting body of residencies, and really looking at co-production as a way to go forward in the GME world. So if you wanted to read about co-production also, Eric Kumbold is very prominent in this area. Wendy, thanks for that comprehensive overview. Absolutely, my pleasure. Um, so I think we're up for any discussion. Elizabeth, what do you say next? That could you show the last slide, please? That concludes our journey. No, could you go to the last slide? Absolutely. So we do have a survey we'd like you to complete and we have our next speaker next month, February 25th, about a month from now revisiting the core clinical skills of history and physical when caring for patients with chronic disease. Um, this is a really interesting article related to clinical medicine. And Judy Breno will be doing this also from the Zucker School of Medicine as well. She's an internist in the Department of Medicine. Um, if you'd complete the survey link, we'd appreciate it. And Elizabeth, since we do have one more minute, do you just want to show your blog for a minute and make sure everybody knows where they can access that or not? Well, thank you very much. So pretty much what I can do is I can edit in my link. So it is my attempt and whenever there's an upcoming session in Journal Club or anything that affects the community as well as our students, undergrad across the continuum, that I aim to write a blog post that helps the participants of the session to really briefly grasp what is going on before they jump into the session. And let me show you where it is, there's a little bit of time. Actually, what I can do, I can go right into my own article. Um, Elizabeth, while you're setting that up, yes. um, I just had a brief question. This is just kind of, has been toiling in the back of my mind while I was reading <laughs> yeah. about co-production is that, yeah. is there um, maybe perhaps an elephant in the room that needs to be addressed in terms of students integrating themselves in um, the faculty world of creating a curriculum. I'm, I'm more, you know, as I'm part of the Zucker School of Medicine, so I'm more like UME, more so than GME, but I, I'm just wondering within the literature, has there been any issues that were addressed in terms of student participation in co-production or collaborating or even, you know, providing feedback on building a curriculum? And also along the side with that, um, there was that um, one point about training students on, you know, not just administrative kind of communication skills, but also um, curriculum design and technology and stuff. But is there something also that needs to be trained, not so much trained, but kind of a primer or uh, having priming the students on the uh, um, environment that they're going to get integrated into, like the faculty environment and all that. I don't know if that's something that's ever been addressed or is, if it's even an issue. I'm, I'm not quite sure. No, Wendy, I think this is a very important point. And I have been giving um, workshops for students with IMC for several times now for students to show them the tools how to do, how to be integrated, right, and how to drive curriculum development. And we do, we do service up, we, we survey our students and the information is always that they have no idea how to do this. And they always feel they're kind of something, some breadcrumbs in terms of questions trickle down to them and they feel, well, they are the consumers, but there is a gap in communication, but they don't know how to talk about the gap because they don't have the verbiage and they don't have the technical tools to really approach a stakeholder and ask about something. Mm -hmm. So it is, for my own service, we see that this is really a need, but at the same time, I have to say, if the medical school from their own side doesn't create a structure to really accept students in and create them or groom them, you know, as their future equals and as their future colleagues, it, it will be a problem because then you have only only one side that wants something, right? It has to be a partnership. Right. And of I course, agree. yeah, and of course, I mean, it's really hard for established leadership to take themselves back and listen to the students and. 
as soon as, I mean, if somebody starts, they will probably not get it right at the beginning, right? So there gotta be room for improvement and room for, for mistakes, right? And there's very little tolerance usually for mistakes, but there has to be this mutual trust. So, but more and more medical schools come out there though and collaborate and, and for instance, there's the Pathways curriculum from Harvard. So they deliberately includes a student consortium that gives them feedback on an ongoing basis. So Elizabeth, we give feedback on an ongoing basis, students, but then they don't go to the next step of the change. That's when I made my point before. All right. So on the curriculum committee, students okay. give feedback, but that next step of co-production really for change, I'm not sure that happens. I'm not sure that happens either. All right, guys. So I yeah, there was a word. Uh, no, I just feel like you know it's. You could say you have co-production because students are on a curriculum committee, but is that really co-production? What Anita did where she co-produced a residency curriculum as a resident with a faculty member, that's true co-production. Yeah, that's a good point. Oh, there's, there's a lot of things that need to be done. Okay, guys, in the interest of time, so I, I, I hope you see my screen at this point. Yep. Okay, so this is my very latest blog that I do. So it's one of the blogs that I do. It's included in my signature. So if you ever got an email from me in my signature, there is the blog link. And in this case, I was talking about co-production of students and reaching a little bit out. This is usually what I try to do. And what I have most fun doing is including students into my blogs or any kind of stakeholders. So don't be surprised if I include, if, if I approach you and ask you if you wanna write a blog with me. So Alice, you're probably on my list. So be warned. It, it is a pleasure and I have a, I have a pretty good template together how this is going to be done and it's the turnaround is fast. It's a very facile thing to do. If you want to do this, let me know or I might approach you. But anyways, it's a new product and it's lovely to do and hopefully I'm reaching a lot of readers and get the institution out, work across institutions, collaborate across institutions and learning a lot from other colleagues that are out there. And it is 12.55, I think with the time in mind, we're closing. Um, I'm thanking my audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fanari, for being here with us. Just looking somewhere, anyways. No, I'm here. <laughs> Anita, I'm here. thank you very much for being my discussant, Wendy, as usual. And we close this presentation. Alice, would you like to give any closing remarks? No, I, I think it was great. Uh, can you get out of sharing your screen would be helpful. Thank you. You're still sharing your, oh no. I don't know, that's the I'm real. I'm trying to get to gallery view. I'm trying to get to gallery view, sure. but they're there. Okay, thank you everyone. And um, we'll have this posted on the faculty development website as a, um, you know, within a week or so. So thank you. Fabulous. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you, month. everyone. See you soon. Bye bye. You could end the recording, Elizabeth. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Anita.